the circumstantial nature of this case, an important piece of the puzzle is the ability of law enforcement to place Brian Koberger at the scene of the murders at the time that they took place. They've relied on historic cell site location information to make this connection. So we're gonna take a look at how the defense is gonna approach that evidence. One of the things that we learned from the probable cause affidavit is that once police began to narrow in on Brian Koberger as a suspect, they got a search warrant for his cell phone records, specifically for the time frame of when the murders happened and approximately 24 hours on both sides. That information was then provided to an FBI technical analyst. And based on that review, police determined that the cell phone was using cellular resources within the cities of Moscow and Pullman and related areas in a way that tended to uh, correspond with the movements of the white sedan that they had already identified as the suspect vehicle. So this was an important piece of the overall probable cause picture because although we can associate the white sedan potentially with, with these murders based on being on video, <laughs> leaving the scene at a, at a high rate of speed approximately after the murders occurred, that doesn't necessarily put Brian Koberger behind the wheel. It's certainly possible somebody can borrow a car, somebody can steal a car. So being able to link his cell phone to the car is a very important piece of being able to connect Brian Koberger with the car. Typically, your cell phone is you know, pretty intimate uh, device. Uh, many of us have it on our bodies at most times if not all times of the day, there's a lot of information in there that, uh, you know, you don't, you don't want some random person to get your phone and be able to, you know, scroll, scroll through your photos and your messages and things like that. So most of us take pretty strong steps to protect our phones and we often have them on us at all times. So if the phone is in the same place as the car, that just makes it more likely that Brian Koberger himself is also in the car during these time periods. And it forecloses an argument that, you know, yes, maybe it was his car, but that doesn't mean you can put him behind the wheel. So taken at face value, this cell site location information looks pretty damning, but there's a lot that isn't said in the probable cause affidavit that could have a big effect on how significant this information is. And specifically, the probable cause affidavit doesn't tell us what exactly is the data that you're relying on, what is the methodology that you're using to trace the vehicle, and what is your confidence in the accuracy of the results that you're reaching. So these are things that defense attorneys are going to focus on. We're going to talk real quickly about how cell site location information works so that you can get an understanding of the types of holes that the defense is going to be looking for in this evidence. So in very simple terms, a cell phone acts a lot like a two-way radio. It periodically and regularly communicates with cell phone antennas in its area to evaluate the strength of the signals that are, are, are available so that when you need to use your phone to make a call or get on the internet, whatever it is that you're doing, uh, the phone is able to identify what's the strongest signal here to connect to. So it's that communication that is the historic cell site location information that police are relying on here. There's some important limitations on this information. So first off, you might think, well, if the phone is nearest to one tower, that tower is going to be giving the strongest, strongest signal. So if the phone connects to that tower, it means the phone is probably near that tower. That would be a faulty uh, line of reasoning. And the reason why is because there are a lot of different factors that can affect which cell phone tower a phone will connect to. Uh, things like weather can affect signal strength, things like call traffic, uh, all kinds of other factors dealing with the capacity of the tower, the capacity of the phone. Uh, so a single connection to a single tower is not particularly strong evidence of location. 
So because of that, to use this type of information to really identify a, a person's location with pretty high specificity and reliability, police generally have to rely on one of two methods. Uh, one is to use GPS data. GPS data is using satellite triangulation. Uh, it, it goes, you know, a bit above and beyond the cell towers. Uh, so GPS data, if they're able to get it, very, very reliable, very precise. Um, that tends to be, from my perspective <laughs> as the defense lawyer, uh, the best evidence of, of location that uh, police can generally get. We didn't see anything about GPS data in the probable cause affidavit. So that tells us they probably weren't able to get that from his cell phone records. It is still possible that GPS data could be obtained from something like his vehicle's navigation system, or if they get the actual physical phone itself and can do uh, extraction from the phone, they may be able to recover GPS data from that as well. But at least at this point, based on the probable cause affidavit, they don't have it. So that leaves us with the alternative method of triangulation. So the way that triangulation works is, as we've said, your, your phone is constantly trying to communicate with towers in the area. And so when it's got simultaneous communication going on with multiple towers, it's checking the signal from here, the signal from here, and it's comparing them to see which one is stronger. Uh, then that information can be used to triangulate the position of the cell phone. And so typically police are going to need either a simultaneous connection to at least three towers or a connection to at least two towers along with an angle of the connection with uh, at least one of the towers. And so from there, it's really just basic tr trigonometry. Uh, they're able to uh, figure out from that point uh, where within a relatively typically precise degree uh, of certainty where that cell phone is located. So the key point here is that with triangulation to be able to place somebody's location fairly precisely and fairly accurately, the critical piece here is multiple simultaneous connections to different cell antennas. So this is very common in dense urban areas Back on the East Coast, uh, places like New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., you might have a cell antenna every other block. And a cell antenna can have a range of many, many miles. Um, I think the longest I remember reading about is about 30 miles, which gives that antenna a coverage of approximately 2,700 square miles. So that's a pretty big area for a single antenna to be able to uh, communicate with, with cell phones. So if you have a lot of those really close together, then there's all kinds of communication happening with that cell phone, uh, with every tower potentially that's, that's, it's within that tower's range. But that type of overlapping coverage is much less common in remote rural areas. And guys, Moscow, Idaho, it's pretty remote. If you haven't gone on Google Maps or Google Earth or something like that, look at Moscow, Idaho and just start to zoom out. Because I think it's important if you're not from this area, you may not have the perspective on how much wide open space there is out here with absolutely nothing in it. Uh, I'll just tell a quick anecdote about when I drive from uh, where I used to practice law in Walla Walla, Washington. If I were going to drive over to the Pullman area, uh, approximately, you know, an hour out of Walla Walla, you, you lose all cell, cell phone coverage and you're out of coverage for like 45 minutes, an hour until you get to the town of, of Colfax. So there are huge spaces out here that have no cell coverage whatsoever. So the point here is that there is 
a much greater likelihood in this situation than there would be if we were looking at murders in Washington, D.C. or New York, that they may not have the type of overlapping cell tower coverage that you really need to be able to perform a precise location analysis. And this raises red flags for me reading the probable cause affidavit because of this kind of vagueness of the language that is used, the, the cell phone utilized cellular resources. We don't know what that means. Uh, they're not telling us, are, is it using multiple tower resources, or are you just saying it pinged to a tower in that location? The problem is, if the phone just pinged to a tower in Moscow, uh, we need to know what is the range of that tower in Moscow, because you can't triangulate a precise location from it. All it tells you is that the phone was within range of that tower at that time. And if that tower, you know, it's probably not 2,700 square miles that it covers, but it could be 10, it could be 20, it could be 50. And that's not a really very precise location piece of, piece of data to be able to rely on to say, therefore, he was at the house at the time that these murders took place. So this is something that the defense is going to be scrutinizing very, very carefully. Of course, the probable cause affidavit isn't expected to or required to include all of the ins and outs of all of the information that the police got, uh, you know, the details of the data and the, and the analysis and so forth. But that is information that is going to need to be provided in discovery. And so this is something that I 100% expect Brian Koberger's team is going to get their own expert to go in and review what exactly did the FBI do here? What exactly were they relying on to be able to create this, this, this theory of the location of the cell phone? Uh, without a strong basis, if, if the defense is able to impeach that methodology, then that link between Brian Koberger personally, you know, by way of his cell phone, and the movements of that sedan on the nights of the murder, uh, that link is significantly weakened. And so that can potentially open the door for the defense to raise questions about, okay, maybe it was the Elantra, but how do you know it was Brian Koberger who was in the Elantra? There's another detail in the probable cause affidavit that tends to cause some concern about the reliability of whatever method it is that the FBI used here. And that's found at page 15 of the affidavit where it says, investigators found that the 8458 phone did connect to a cell phone tower that provides service to Moscow on November 14th, 2022. But investigators do not believe the 8458 phone was in Moscow on that date. This is potentially a problem, uh, depending on what exactly police mean when they said in the earlier parts of the affidavit that the phone was utilizing cellular resources. Uh, does that mean it connected to a single tower? Does it mean it connected to multiple towers? We don't know at this point, but if it's the same type of connection that they're talking about in, in this sentence that it's just the phone connected to it to a tower in that vicinity, then this line here tells us that connecting with the tower in Moscow is not proof that the phone itself was in Moscow. And this just goes back to what I said earlier about there being all kinds of different reasons for why a cell phone will connect with a particular tower. And proximity is one factor, but it is not the dispositive factor at all. So Based on this sentence, it's possible that Mr. Koberger was, you know, sitting in his apartment in Pullman and there was some disruption to the service from the nearest tower in Pullman. And as a result, his phone backed up to the next available signal coming from Moscow, Idaho. If this is the type of information, the type of data that the location analysis is based on, then this line 
just creates huge problems for law enforcement because if we can't rely on this this connection to tell us what the location was on this particular occasion, then what reason do we have to find it reliable for establishing his location at all of the other times that that we talked about in the affidavit? So this is potentially very undermining if this is the same type of evidence that uh, was, was relied on in that FBI analysis to do the the recreation of the cell phone's locations. Besides potentially undermining the state's conclusions about location that can be drawn from this evidence, the other reason why the defense is likely to go pretty hard at the data and the methodology here is because those could potentially undermine the admissibility of the evidence altogether. Idaho has two rules of evidence that deal with the admission of expert testimony. So under the first rule, expert testimony is generally going to be admissible when it's going to be helpful to the jury to understand technical or scientific issues. And in a related rule, the basis for that as expert's testimony, that the data that they relied on, uh, can potentially also be admissible if it's the type of data that experts in that field really reasonably rely upon. And so what these rules working together tend to do is they allow quite a lot of expert testimony that is generally accepted in the scientific community. Now, I want to be clear, Idaho doesn't specifically follow the Fry standard or the Daubert standard, if you're, you're familiar with those. Um, these are just different standards that exist uh, in different courts for whether or not scientific uh, expert evidence is admissible. But uh, Rule 702 in particular is where defense has an avenue to attack it as not being helpful to the jury if it's not reasonably reliable. If this is not something that we can say we have a lot of confidence in because it's not based on the same data or the same methodology that people who are doing a lot of these uh, <laughs> locations and testifying in court about them uh, would use, then that's really going to call into question whether it's viable information to put in front of the jury or not. The problem, of course, is if it's not accurate, uh, you're painting it up as if it is. You're, you're putting somebody on the stand with the imprimatur of, of an expert, a scientist, or, or something like that. Uh, and that's going to tend to tip the thumb on the scale of making it sound like it's potentially a lot more significant than it is. So if it's not a reliable methodology, uh, it's not going to be helpful to the jury. It's just going to, to lead them astray. And so there have been situations where different types of analyses of cell site location uh, information have not been admissible in court. They've been excluded as being insufficiently reliable. So that's why, from my perspective, uh, the GPS data or the triangulation methodology, these are the best ways of being able to, to get this type of, of argument in, in front of the jury because those are pretty well established and the parameters of what conclusions can be drawn from, from those uh, are, are pretty well understood. But if there's some other type of theory being used here, uh, we don't know if that theory has any scientific validation. We don't know if other people are going to agree that this is a reliable way to, uh, to process this, this type of, of cell site location information. So these details are going to be of critical importance, and uh, that's a big reason why I think defense is going to give a great deal of scrutiny to this particular piece of the state's case. I've intended for this to be a very brief and very cursory overview of an issue that is highly technical and frankly well out of my area of expertise. Uh, I rely on experts to educate me on this type of thing. Uh, but if you are interested in a little bit more of a deep dive on this topic, I'm going to link in the, descri in the description 
an article from the Richmond Journal of Law and Technology. It does a great job from my perspective of talking about how the cell, cell phone information works and what some of the legal limitations and uh, parameters are for using it in court. So uh, I hope you find that helpful if that's something that you're interested in learning more about. Besides the cell site location information, probably the next strongest piece of evidence, or at least the one that looks the worst, uh, that defense is going to need to focus on real carefully is the DNA evidence. So we're going to take a look at what defense might be thinking as they evaluate that particular information. I hope you'll join me and I'll see you in the next video.